This portion of the news brought to you by McDonald's. McDonald's, I'm loving it. Fire destroyed a two-story structure on East Bay Street, which was the childhood home of the first Bahamian Governor General, Sir Milo Butler. Janae Noel Ferguson was on the scene, and she tells us tonight that the fire quickly spread, causing significant smoke damage to a nearby home and apartment complex. I was just scared. I didn't want to stay in there because my baby was laying down in the bed. A frightening experience for Carla Dunhart Clark, who alerted her family of the fire next door that engulfed the old Butler homestead. We smelled the smoke, Annie Joe smelled the smoke, and we ran across the road, me, mommy, the baby, and Annie Joe. But I didn't have a chance to get anything. Fire, strong winds, and rain made it challenging for fire crews. And area residents were apparently upset with firefighters claiming they were not acting fast enough. Why you won't help the people? Okay, it's so a you, fire. You know how many people we help? You all had concerns with, with them uh, not assisting. Yeah, because we had to fight them to come and help. When we got here, we met a two-story wooden structure fully ablaze. We arrived here some three minutes after receiving the information. And upon the arrival of the first unit, there was a need for additional units to be called. Evans also revealed that while they attempted to put out the blaze, one of the officers was injured and taken to hospital. And just to give you an idea of how intense the heat from this blaze was, this car, some feet away from the fire, suffering extensive damage. The building behind me is an apartment complex. The paint is peeling from the building because of the heat. And then over here, there's a vehicle that was parked some feet away from the fire, suffering extensive damage to the exterior from the heat of this blaze. Residents in the area say the building where Sir Milo grew up, which also served as a food store, remained vacant for some time. They were hoping that something would be done to preserve what they say could have been a historical site. I'm close with the family. They've been telling me they were trying to fix it up to bring it back as a historic place, mm -hmm. you know, because they know who, who yeah, I know. was there. And he grew up with seven kids there. And uh, well, they never get around to doing it. There were some efforts made and we were looking into possibly restoring the building at some point in time. But it was built by my um, grandfather many years ago. And unfortunately, um, it went up this morning. It almost feels like you lost another member of your family. After fire crews were able to get most of the fire under control, the Johnson family hurried to collect whatever they could, thankful that their lives were spared. It isn't as bad as I thought, so we can repair it as quickly as we can with the help of Mr. Butler. Uh, the, the Johnsons, they're, they're just like family, you know, so uh, um, some accommodation, I'm sure we're going to get together and do the best that we can. Now Evans reported that they have no clue of how the fire started, but because it is an abandoned building, it could have been home to vagrants. He says, however, that the neighboring home was not totally destroyed and those residents might be able to reside there in about a week or so. Janae Noel Ferguson, ZNES Network News. Member of Parliament for the area, Richard Lightburn, was also on the scene today, reaching out to those affected. He says he too was saddened to see the historical building go up in flames. I'm, I'm shocked at the incident. I'm, I'm very, you know, very sorry for those that have been affected. Um, I understand the police, uh, the fire department was here very quickly and did a good job in in, in restraining it because I. I'm sure there are a lot of houses around here that could have been damaged. Um, unfortunately, the one right next to it, it was, it was damaged. And, um, it looks like severe damage to that house. But it seems that that's just confined to these, uh, these two buildings. The stand, it was Sir Milo's birthplace and, and that he, um, he lived there for many years. Of course, there was the, remember the ice plant uh, that was there and, and the little uh, convenience store that was there for many years. Um, so it is really a tragedy because this is one of those sites that I think we, um, we have far too few of in the country. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it is something that should have been preserved, but I don't know. Well, from a sudden blaze to a lingering menace, it was a smoky night for residents throughout New Providence who continued to be impacted from those fires at the city dump. Superintendent Walter Evans, who, had the who heads the fire branch of the Royal Bahamas Police Force, noted that fires at the dump are still flaring up, but every effort is being made to suppress them. We can say that we know that the fire smoke, there was some smoke odor, which we believe may have emanated from the city dump as far as East Street. Um, and so that tells you exactly to the extent to which a number of persons would have been affected. 
But again, every effort is being made then to provide relief to these persons. We know that it is not easy, but again, you know, the efforts are being made to bring this fire under full extinguishment um, so that persons can breathe a sigh of relief so that they can get their lives back to normalcy. A delay in ha hazardous pay for some 300 public servants escalated into a full-fledged demonstration in front of Parliament today. Dozens of government electricians, plumbers and carpenters employed by the Ministry of Works assembled in downtown Nassau hoping to have their concerns heard by the Prime Minister and his deputy. President of the Bahamas Public Services Union John Pinder told ZNS News today that the union has been fighting for the hazardous pay from 2005 as workers are entitled to receive the pay under the existing industrial agreement. The union president says he's been in talks with the minister on the issue but is still waiting for a resolution. It's been more than a year since they've been promised that they would have been paid the following month. I spoke with the Permanent Secretary about a week or two ago. He indicated that he has done all he can to cause the payments to be executed. He has forwarded on to the Department of Public Services. I spoke with the Senior Under Secretary there, and he has advised me there were some meetings to discuss this, but there was no final decision made on when payments would be executed. Upon me relating that information to the maintenance staff, in addition to them having problems with promotions and so they they're kind of just stressed out about the whole thing and they're hoping that they can get the prime minister to who's the minister of finance to cause the minister of state for finance minister alkidis to free up some funds so that they can receive the hazardous pay Pinder says the hazardous pay is more than necessary, especially as workers risk their lives on behalf of the government every day but don't enjoy any medical coverage. In its new proposed industrial agreement, the union is hoping to have mandatory hazard pay attached to the salaries of those affected. But when we reached out to Deputy Prime Minister the Honorable Philip Davis today, he told us that he thought the matter had already been addressed. As I speak today, I was not aware that that was still the case. Um, I, I will sometime during the course of today find out more about that and address it. I thought that the issues relating that had been resolved several months ago because I intervened back then uh, and I had expected it to be resolved. I just find out what the true issue is about it. In responding to the union's comments, the Ministry of Labor produced a chart to disclose the successful closure of major contractual and industrial disputes the PLP government has resolved since coming to office. This comes as labor officials brand the Customs and Immigration Union's Vice President Sloan Smith's comments that the PLP took advantage of unions as irresponsible and inaccurate. A labor ministry spokesman said such irresponsible and contentious statements underscore the true value of the importance of meaningful and cordial dialogue between the government and the trade union movement. Labor officials will continue with its genuine mandate and commitment to the tripartite system of industrial relations in the country. The statement concluded that in future union leaders, notwithstanding their peculiar grievances, would remain on the high road in their criticisms and not pander to political mischief. Will a financial boost for the crisis center here who made the donation? And also coming up tonight is the Monroe Mitchell Rao simmering down. Find out coming up. You're watching The Bahamas Tonight. This portion of the news was brought to you by McDonald's. McDonald's, I'm loving it. This is your Royal Fidelity Business News. I'm Jimenita Swain. Next month, the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employers Confederation is planning a first-of-a-kind national conclave of Chambers of Commerce in the Bahamas. The events set for April 2nd through 3rd will assemble not only representatives from each family island chamber to discuss local matters of importance, but it will provide a national forum for industry leaders, the private sector, and senior policymakers to discuss topics of national relevance. At the end of the conclave, the BCCEC will also present present a detailed report to government and private sector, the contents of which it hopes will assist in crafting the 30-year National Economic Plan. In other business news, Norwegian Cruise Line announced this week that Guy Harvey has been named to design the signature hull artwork of the line's largest ship to date, Norwegian Escape, scheduled to debut in October 2015. Harvey is widely recognized as the world's finest marine wildlife artist and champion of ocean conservation. 
Harvey said he was deeply honored to be asked by Norwegian to paint the full hull of the newest and largest ship in their fleet. Norwegian's newest ship is Harvey's largest canvas to date at 1,065 feet in length, with his artwork spanning from hull to the aft, featuring two undersea scenes that blend seamlessly. And in international business news, for those of you who shop online and use Amazon Prime, this bit of news may interest you. The company announced today that it would raise its annual shipping fee by 25%, which is right up to but not over the important $99 level. Originally, it planned to increase the fee to $119, but that did not sit well with consumers. This is of interest because Amazon has placed a great deal of emphasis on delivering value. This is the first time it's raised the fee for Amazon Prime in the nine years the program has operated. That was your Royal Fidelity Business News. I'm Jiminita Swing.